Hello, my name is Kevin Bateman, and this is events in spiritual places that people have forgotten to visit. Welcome to the Circle of the Eternal Sun. Thank you. And I give you Kieran O'Driscoll. How many do you want me to read? Three poems. Right. Sorry, I should have had this marked. Angel Hour. This is a poem uh, about something that actually happened to me in Croatia um, when I was uh, renting a, a small um, house beside the sea. So it just goes to show you strange things can happen anywhere. Angel Hour. This morning I thought of the angels I saw in a pre-dinner catnap some years ago in Istria and the tremendous crack of thunder that same day in a village where we lunched on our way back to the coast. I remember how they stood in rank with their backs to me on a road of golden clouds that climbed into the sky from our holiday bedroom. Luminous, light as whispers, I fancy they appeared at the equidistant point between lunch and dinner, and wonder was that the point of fasting in the old church, visions, possibility, the deeds of saints and martyrs, the heights of Alvernia, the desert and the voice that cried in the wilderness. The dry thunderclap started me from my soup. What I'd read about the war came to mind, though it never got to the bistro we sat outside on the Borgo's single street. I had ordered a second glass of Pinot Grigio when, bang, a mortar shell behind me blasted the afternoon. But everything was okay, the thunder merely a warning. Two glasses are enough. And then the angels showed in the stretch of abstinence before the night's renewal of appetite and glut. The wrong kind of dog. The sea tells me, not in so many words, that all I'd care to say has been said before, and that if anyone has said it well, it's the old poets. So what am I doing here in this creative bustle of the wind and sky and sea, on a blustery shore where everything is bobbing like a boat? Houses no longer in their stratified layers are jogging randomly around the cove, a few hardy humans along the sand. A seagull pauses in mid-air to watch. And there's the yelping of unpleasant dogs at odds on straining leashes, with the wind and also there's the yelping of the light harsh but not ear splitting as it strains on the leash of the sun surely it is a gale that's drumming up this mighty fuss though the wrong kind of dog is always found on a strand old foamer in its oily coils the sea says all this has been said before drenching me in someone else's shoes. And finally, I'll read one of my tributes to surrealism as, an, uh, as a visual art. Um, this is called The Lost Jockey, and it's named after a painting or series of paintings and sculptures by René Magritte. Uh, which shows a jockey galloping through a very ornate country house garden with all kinds of strange objects in it, such as um, spindles and so on. Um, I suppose I always knew deep down that someday it would come to this 
And I would return to the question posed by that fellow, Magritte. To Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropos, and snake-haired goddesses, the Furies, or the Fates, or whoever it is they are, who are in hot pursuit. And when such an event occurs erupting on the ordinary scene, there's always someone watching from behind a crimson curtain who has seen it and says nothing, only to suffer thirty years on, a kind of falling apart. In the lowlands they call it the KZ syndrome, when the truth sprouts from the brain's spindles, ridiculous but no longer containable. Was it that he caught my eye as he galloped past in flight from those invisibles, his face that of an ill-starred child hidden in the attic for fear of visitors? There has been far too much geometry in these parts. The regime has been far too regular and begged a madness to break out, a thundering of hooves along the drives. Someone is not in his proper place, Something is not quite right. A forest felled and turned is breaking into leaf. And I give you Linda Louise Galvin. Raining isotopes. The brown of the earth met her ankles in green fields and buttercups, as happy as a child on handlebars, breathing air like the last molecule of oxygen in the chamber. Summer showers after torrential downpours of vanilla essence rain. One need not complain under the purple light and bees, powerful buzzing, smouldering, blistering heat, like being baptised or being chastised. Daddy said you can choose to see the world in grey tones or rainbows with the magic of closed eyes and clasped hands, anticipation and mumble prayers, while the random look of God continues with bastinado on a Tuesday and V the next night, when all was purposed to be sleeping and calm. I have searched through scrambles of words left in old diaries, in dusty bookshelves of my childhood, but I cannot find words describe the happiness that my family gave me, or how I'll need to save a seat for the devil when he visits. We must salute the negative as though its ladder has just lost its brother. Yet we will shout stolen valor with the Wilhelm scream in the day and the night while the remaining brother walks from darkness into light. A melting tarmac village of Gaza, an abandoned child in Pripyat out of sudden desperation. 40 seconds of exposure was all they were allowed. Why must we live in the shadows of the emotions related to having stayed that extra second? And we bow our heads anyway. The mahogany tree is where I'll be. The more I give to you, the more I have, because we are infinite. Both infinite like granite and stone, bashed by the wind on a winter's day, unsettling fossils of another time. Each grain of sand to represent our love swaying softly on the swings of the sea. I see your star, it's light in the dark sky's night and think of you in linen sheets and white and blue and purple. Tucked in a bed that I can't see, hear my incantation of love and demise on the edge of the world. Is that where you'll be? Singing your lullaby to the warm night, humming to me always with love. My prayers will guide me today. I am sorry for my absence, but I'll see you someday. And I'll wake with ease from a stormy night with a coffee left steaming by my bedside because we are infinite, infinite like granite and stone. And I give you own Devereaux. The poem is called Hawthorn. At the end of our corporation terrace, there was a piece of rough ground, three-cornered, just big enough for an ancient funeral mound 
are a stack of plastic cider flagons. An old hawthorn was its only tree, long-armed, spindly, with arms that stretched like, like a crucifix against the leaden sky. With its sunken hollow, the hawthorn was a doll's house, a garage, a hospital, a classroom, a tabernacle, where we lodged our dreams. The second poem is a poem called Gavel, and the original meaning of the word gavel was prize, and it's a word that my mother would have used a great deal. She was uh, very much a speaker of Hiberno English. Gavel. From the rough, slanted field, a streel of a scarecrow bears witness to a brimful cup left on the doorstep, an extra place at the kitchen table, an empty chair by the fire, a crossed, still warm loaf on the slender window sill, an offering to lost souls who sometimes pass in the night, straying between here and there. Darkness drops early in these quarter days, but the flickering of the bonfire permits her to see the masked mummers who traipse from door to door, clown-making, seeking gavel. I've been writing a lot this year about the place that I'm from in Limerick City. I'm from a place called Kennedy Park, an old working class estate in Limerick, and I've been writing a lot about the Roxborough Road, that road that leads from the estate that I grew up in into the city centre. It's probably a mile, mile and a half long, and there are simply so many stories associated with that part of Limerick. This is called The Permanent Way. Bowstringed, Maher's viaduct totally stretches over the six-line permanent way. Aerosol graffiti declares, Sligo, don't bother us. Underneath, a schoolboy scrawl proclaims, H-blocks, punk rock, the clash, join the IRA. Just before Shaw's bloody slaughterhouse, an arc of road blanketed in sleet winds between prison and madhouse. There, sockless, coatless, standing at six foot four, Ziggy O'Brien, legs leaden from the tablets, wanders up and down the short length of the jail boreen. They say he went insane listening to Space Oddity, but then again it might just be in the blood, for the nerves were never great in that family. Craning his long neck, Ziggy O'Brien takes nine straight jacketed goose steps. If he fails, he has to start all over again. His fag-brown fingertips ready rub the mental hospital's craggy, solid boundary. Ask Ziggy what he is doing, and he always offers the same reply. I'm searching in the karstic crevices to find the magic key fashioned with silver, extracted by spacemen from Mars. It is the power to free everyone behind chained bars and most importantly to unleash all those who are prisoners of the mind. Thank you. And I give you Nathaniel O'Reilly. Kangaroo. Stand at the kitchen sink, washing dishes. Stare at the rocks, boulders, grass, pine, eucalyptus and olive trees on the hillside until a kangaroo bounds past uphill. Step outside for a better look as another eastern grey rounds the corner of the house, jumps the fence like it's invisible and heads uphill, following its companion. Hurdle the wires and follow the ruse between boulders ducking under olive-laden boughs. Surrender the pursuit, climb the outcrop and look down upon the house. Gaze across farmland, luxuriating in afternoon sunshine. Take selfies, capture the landscape's beauty over your shoulder. As he lies dying, 
for Peter George O'Reilly. In another hemisphere, across half a continent and an ocean, my grandfather lies dying. I am unable to hold his hand, kiss his forehead, share a long neck of Carlton Draft, say, remember when your bull almost gored me at Timboon? I should have listened to you and stayed on the tractor. My daughter loves the painting of the galah you gave her last time we visited, before we had to put you in the home. The Gerildery letter is pure Irish bush poetry. I often recall the taste of the molasses you gave me from the bucket in the dairy after milking at Tim Boone. You never told me your favourite Slim Dusty song. I never cared that I didn't catch any fish when you took me fishing at Logan's Beach. I just wanted to watch you cast out beyond the breaking waves, reel in whiting after whiting as if they were waiting for you to bring them home. I always admired the way you broke the necks of the kittens we found in the hessian sack beside the rubbish bin in the beach car park. You were stoic in your mercy, but I saw the tear before you erased it with the back of your sun-damaged hand. Beach Ballet. In the midst of an Irish heat wave, lying on a long board in the swale at La Hench, chatting with a Paul Kelly lookalike between sets, I look over my right shoulder towards the beach and watch a tween girl catch a wave, rise to her feet, balance gracefully, knees bent, arms wide and relaxed, ride all the way to the shallows before stepping lightly off the side of the board into knee-deep foam. The girl's ride is almost complete before I recognize her as my daughter, just 20 minutes into her first lesson, adapting, evolving, becoming herself. And I give you Emer Fallon. The summer scarf. I left the house decked in my new summer scarf. At the end of the lane, I met a woman dressed in red, standing at the roadside with the clippers in her hands, examining a tangle of brambles. She looked at one bramble with utter contempt and flung it onto the road. When the man who delivers the coal drove over it, she wept. Why are you crying? I said. It's just a bramble, that's all. She glared at me through dull red eyes. That's not the point you made. That's not the point at all. Why are you people so stupid? She pointed at the ditch where the dark barbs crept, sending out multiple arms to choke, damp tufts of grass on Rudy Betch. I left her and didn't turn back until the rain came. On my way home, I met a small black dog, a cat missing his tail, and two young girls, both long dead. When I stood in to let a car pass, a bramble snagged my scarf. Let go of me, you bastard, I growled. The hair skin. After my grandmother married, she never wore it again. She left the hair skin in the family home, folded in tissue in a walnut wood drawer. Years later, my mother found it. During a summer spent dreaming and dancing to records played in her aunt's gramophone. She took the skin out and slipped it on, bounded down narrow grassy lanes, hind legs slapping the ground as she fed from a drowsy cow. She wore it until it crumbled to dust and a whole world vanished with it of changing babies and ghostly tunes, playing on a dark hillside to lure drunk men into underground worlds never to return. Now the hare is a mad march creature swerving through fading fields, seeking what it has lost, ears cocked for the sound of a long ago song, playing in a hazy attic room, on and on and on. And my last poem is called Questions. Driving through town after the first lockdown, I see him outside the funeral home. He stands like he knows he belongs in this place. A stranger from a time I thought was long gone, where chillblains in winter were part of life and babies lost were whispers. 
and clouds of smoke mass, the smell of piss and the threat of straying hands was accepted. I picture him listening to the radio in his kitchen, deciding to come, draining his tea, fetching from the wardrobe his black flannel slacks and the jacket he bought when his sister passed. I realise now I've been running from someone like him for years, casting off worn leather shoes as I go and hand me down jumpers that choked my child's neck and thick layers of blankets that weighed me down and paraffin heaters that singed my legs. But today, seeing him here after all this time, I have only questions left. Does the weather scare you? Do you ever pray? What wakes you in the middle of the night? Can potatoes suffer if they're planted too deep? And that fear you feel when you see the leaves curl, do you think it's the memory of hunger? Thank you. And I give you Daniel Wade. Good. First one's called uh, Tableau Vivant. Penichets crawl under each stone-faced bridge. Stealthy as swans, the water roiling aqua green, and dusk's dazed zinzolin triumphantly arched like a yakarlanda, fumes the stale musk of rain. Me, Layla and Sam Comerford stroll the boardwalk, a piche of chilled rosé passing between us. The sen slurs its swash, reflecting our talk and adrift banter of art, of politics, grovelling praise heaped faintly at tyrant's feet. Sunburned, I relish the roche dregs, glad they're both here. Anne was meant to see this too. It was our three-year anniversary, after all. Soon we'd be split and I'd return to my childhood home. But for now, both my sister and my oldest friend remind me I am not fully spurned. It's heartening to see how far they've both come, eking out lives for themselves in an entirely new world without being engulfed. Flames ravage the inner slum, but Paris isn't engulfed either even with the gnarled graffiti and the bellowed simplicity of a slogan, at risk of being retreated into triteness. <laughs> Je suis Charlie, Bas le flic, ISIS suicide by bomb, Operation Chamel, an extended state of brutal enemy, commerce in high vis, marching across the boulevard, intent on ordering a toll booth. Anarchy Rambo might have praised, or Jim Morrison would surely applaud, as clouds of tear gas smear his hotel window, as for me, I watch and wait for dusk to fully darken among lightly aged cobbles, the river now a jade glow, elegiac thoughts of Anne, Sam and Layla talking. Um, next one's called uh, Ligar Jazz Bar. It's a real, it's a real bar. It's based in Paris. It's basically a used mechanical, it's basically a converted mechanic shop, now a jazz bar. Thrum and roosh in that gridiron of tunnels, swallowing all other sound. High speed screech of an inbrown metro, grind of metal off metal, turnstiles steeled, headlights luminous, wind puncturing the sinuses with a nosebleed. From the platform, we see it shunt into the station and board with local ease, ignoring the headway of doors sliding in shadow, metropolitan sweep of tiled enamel, and on a terminal stairway, a light together in shuffled exodus. Like a utilitarian crypt, bass solos slapped to the rafters, brassily frumious against hipstery applause, deceptively derelict as the mural smearing the porch's Art Nouveau maw, cheap Stella on tap, candles, a shroud of drizzle gently hosing us down in the beer garden, as encore and medley follow the saxes' cadence sizzle. Is this the last I'll see or hear of Le Cator Populaire? Time is unaided as smoke, beer becomes me, Jaws lets me drift. Paris remains. I'll be elsewhere. Right. Last one is called um, Iki Se Paris, and it's about um, Charles Baudelaire's 200th birthday. Uh, the title's from the motto for the um, Paris Saint Germain Football Club. Far from the slack jawed look out of gargoyles and the belfries hourly slang, far from the bistro's sulphurously lit terrace and the Seine briefly mirror clear against a livid laudanum sky, 
far from boulangeries and airbrushed views of Il Saint Louis from an Airbnb pied de terre, where neon slithers over drenched asphalt, far from the demi monde burning in autumn's low fervour, you are reminded this is still your city of daedal arcades, you who were lulled by the golden melting point of a hashish smog, laureate of amber dusk and of the traffic jams low gear chanisser serenading the cathedral's smoking husk. Far from the firemen who broke through her wrought iron portals as Le Garde des Francais might, smoke whirling a grey monolith skyward and the fleche in its oaken acuity like a smouldering pillar, god stoked, collapsed with grimace ceremony. Far from the vault bricks plummeting and laden ribs fractured, you are reminded of hailstones that rattle like coffee beans on, in a mason jar off the zinc rooftops, the horses you no longer hear trotting apocalyptically off the cobbles, and the copper sea green statue of the apparatic disciple helicoptered off for repairs. Fodder for tourists insta feeds, here is your city's riot prone heart, now ablaze with neon, her oceries cached with aeons of tibias and famers, shivering archive for the dead. Odd to think that. As long as the light from our headlamps crawls over graffiti, civilization is still near, even far below the familiar rumbles of the metro. Far from the laser lights blinding ultraviolet sweep, from neon painted faces and smoke bombed walls and sweaty light, far from the PAs thudding loudly as war, far from the DJ spinning a remixed web from the turntable, from the damp floor of the city's graffiti bells, you crawl on your stomach through cube light tunnels, rattling in concert all those ivory skulls. You might turn a corner, only for death to offer you a cigarette. Perhaps even greet the skeletal reaper as a friend. It's not sky threshing the soul crop at characteristic random. Yet we have the privilege of paralysis, the luxury of lawlessness, till we see for ourselves that rosy dusk tinging the arandissimon, like an impressionist's fleeting blur, and wave at the cruise boats paddling under Le Pont Neuf Bridge. And remember, this is your city still, Charles, unrecognisable as it might be, c'est la ville lumière. Once the flavour of Beaujolais wine dissolves with each oniophilic swallow, might we regain the city in your name, O patron saint of ivory skulls, keep the catacombs fully stocked, our hands placed on scorched balustrades. The morning fog hovers thin as a veil, that perhaps once sheathed the gorgeous limbs of Herodias' daughter, though not enough to see clearly. Bloody paint splatters colonial statues, a colonnade's bone white trusses glisten as graffiti smears them, like oil or fear, hovers in doorways and parking meters, masks hanging below chins. Do you smell the courage on my breath? It's lingered for hours, drowned out by sweat and craft lager, smoke slurred by the wind, petrol fumes snarled and heavy aftershave. We are the generation that gave up an intimacy by all accounts, calmly eating lunch under patio heaters, as glass shards season the pavement. But I'm not here for volunteer clean-up crews, rinsing down a graffiti splattered plinth from the statue of a long dead trafficker of human cargo, was toppled, nor for the boarded up windows of Le Rocher Posé, Le Coq Sportif, and Gucci, each entrance and exit manned by fleeks. Though I have opal scales for eyes these days, ears immune to the brush of your whisper, there are your verses, black eyed, craveted flaneur, slum socialite, to whose verses my reddened eyes keep returning, that intrigue, mystify, lure, and even after two centuries, inspire awe again. Thank you. And I give you Matt Mooney. Nomads. Nomad caravans plod on in the hourglass trap of unrelenting heat on unceasing pilgrimages with their flocks across the Sinai desert without signposts setting their sights by sun, moon and stars. Low winds erasing footprints in white sand nothing left behind for anyone to follow but against the odds they survive to arrive through milestone dunes on Mount Sinai, Sinai's crags with their healing flora and they pitch their tents to eat and drink Bedouin daily bread on ice cold 
nights where waiting waters flow for the weary camels, sheep and goats all that they possess Inish mine I will go where my heart is lighter I will go soon for I found a place lying beyond in the wild Atlantic where my grandchildren run free getting sure of their own identity up on sand hills roaring, rolling going for swims off the old pier cycling to school all year in safety loving just being young islanders there I'll not feel cold inside at all for island folk are warm hearted knowing ni nyart go kerlikele we should be there for one another on arrival I will marvel once again at hand woven stone grey walls loose knitted and fitted so intricate through centuries of passing time I'll walk on smooth limestone slabs circumventing grikes and tents where goats might hide in hollows of weathered rock that broke away aeons ago This, this oasis off the coast, Elon, all in of our Gaelic speakers, for Tyrant's chains never rattled here, they held on to the wealth they had. I will easily go by criss-cross roads and stop to marvel at a rock pool, dipping my cares in its crystal soul or lean upon a wall for a long look at primroses that have now turned a little green field to a yellow gold. Further on, some sheep and lambs, an upturned boat with lobster pots, a man spading in his spring garden. I'll go back soon to the middle aisle and between two shores I'll watch for each sunrise and the setting sun and I will own the moon above me when it's full again over Inishman. Word and Stone Word by word and stone on stone Lines to keep and thoughts to flow Stops, commas, wedges, slivers. Flat and rugged, sitting tight, solid. Chinks of light grow, breezes through. From bead to bead, slipping lightly. Fingers fingering countless decades. Finding cornered stones for awkward spaces. Standing back, sizing and shaping. Stanzas, verses, highs and, and hollows, your aura floats. Incantations rising, rosaries of fields are built and said and you are safe within these walls by wicker work of word and stone. Thank you. Come on. Can all artists come forward? Everybody come forward. Uh, so we're just going to get a quick shot. Yeah. I just pressed it. Barbara Boyer, so yeah. Okay, sorry. And I give you Barbara Beyer. Um, I was asked to read two pieces today, but if it's all right, I might take a moment to remember a young Kerry woman who ended her own life last night. 
and I did not know Vivian, but my son worked with her. And he didn't work with her often, but when he did, he was kind to her. Others weren't so kind. And I was once a 16-year-old young woman who tried to end her life. And what I'd like to say is it costs us nothing to be kind, but unkindness can cost someone else everything. Um, I was asked to read two pieces. Um, I'd like to read this one instead for Vivian. All the things we cannot say. Tommy had known Lizzie for as long as he could remember, and he remembers everything, but had never been able to look her in the eye, not even now as she stroked his cold hand. All he could do was tremble and stare at the ground where they'd tossed his clothes and smashed all those bottles. Lizzie smelled of pizza and cake and summer, all Tommy's favorite things, all strong smells, happy, they almost masked the smell of pee and poo running down his legs. Lizzie's breath was warm on his face, the face that wouldn't look up, couldn't. Lizzie sniffed like a dog and oh no, her smell changed. Now it was dead roses mulched in fresh dirt. Now it was just like them after they had tied him up. They'd laughed, Tommy had laughed too. After all, it was just a game. But that smell. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lizzie was trying to undo the ropes. Tommy, I can't get them loose. They're all wet and swollen. Lizzie sniffed her fingers and retched like mom when she cleaned his bed. Was she crying? He didn't want to make her cry. Stay here. I'll get help. A frog croaked from Tommy's throat and he began to shake as much as the ropes would let him. The rough fibers sandpapered flakes of his bare skin which drifted in the fading light like whittled wood. It's okay. Lizzie's hand was puffy, puppy fur soft on his bare arm. He loved his puppy. Her name was Lizzie. Lizzie took off her coat and draped it over him the best she could. It slipped to the ground soon as she left. Tommy tried not to be scared tried not to remember their faces like Halloween masks and mean words like the late night programs mom and dad watched. Don't go, Lizzie, Tommy said so quietly he thought he was dreaming. Tommy loved his dreams, which were almost always of Lizzie. But the dusk between the time he closed his eyes and his dreams came, that was scary. It was dusk now, dusk with his eyes open. Tommy leaned back against a tree, drew comfort from the rough wood against his skin. It would be all be worth it when Lizzie saw what he had done. It had taken him days and three kitchen knives, but it was everything he could never say. Tommy smelled Lizzie before he saw her, an excited curry and cola smell. Tommy was excited too. He forgot about his skin raw under ropes, soggy underpants drooping, the cold fucking retard that voice it was martin martin who collected lizzie in his loud chevy camaro with the v8 engine and the 435 horsepower that smelled of grease martin who had tied him up you can't say that lizzie sounded angry angry like his mom had been when she found the broken knives martin came into view first and their eyes met before tommy look, could look away don't you say a word, Martin's eyes warned, or I will kill you. Tommy looked at the hunting knife in Martin's hands and kept his mouth shut. Martin sawed through the rope and Tommy was soon free. He didn't rub his sore arms or reach for his clothes. He had to be brave. In the dying light, Tommy pretended the dusk was dimming and he was dreaming, then looked up and into Lizzie's face as she saw the carving. In the wood, his body had hidden the delicate heart with their names enclosed. Tommy loves Lizzie. First Lizzie looked at Martin and her smell was a skunk hit by a car. Then slowly she turned to Tommy and he, shivering and cold, was brave and did not look away. Full of tears, Lizzie's eyes were sky just after night. 
and her smell, her smell was of all the things she could not say and all his dreams come true. Thank you. Could all the artists come forward?